In this unit, we're going to look at the statement of cash flows, and we're going to look at it uh, and how to prepare a statement of cash flows. Now, keep in mind, basically a statement of cash flows really summarize the change in cash for the entity. So if you look at the balance sheet, and you look at the cash account with the cash equivalents, and you look and see that there's a change in your cash, either your cash went up for the period or your cash went down for the period. The statement of cash flows really summarizes and tells us where our cash is coming from. And there's three primary types of activities where we get cash. One is operating activities. The next is our investing activities. And finally is our financing activities. Now each of these can be defined by very clear things within our financial statements. The cool thing about the statement of cash flow is once you have an income statement, a balance sheet, you can really derive the statement of cash flows without going through every single tr cash transaction for the year. Imagine how many transactions like Target or Walmart or Amazon has and how much cash is moved in and out. You can't go through and look at every transaction and put in your statement of cash flow. So we can use the income statement and the balance sheet to tell us. Well, how do we know what goes where? Well, basically, our operating activities, we get cash inflows from revenues. Okay? So when we look at our income statement, we look at our revenues, we know that those revenues are coming from our cash. Now, we do have to be careful because think about it. Do you have to have all revenues in the form of cash? In other words, for us to recognize revenue, do we have to receive cash? And the answer is no, not in gap-based financial accounting because we're accrual. So when we're looking at this and we say, oh, cash inflows from revenues, we've got to remember that sometimes revenues are non-cash, such as when we sell an account, because our accounts receivable goes up and our revenue goes up, but we don't actually realize cash on that. So cash inflows from revenues, we can get those from the income statement, then we reconcile them back based on what was non-cash during that period. The next thing we've got is cash outflows, and those are from expenses. So really, what we look at is the income statement here. For our operating activities, based on the income statement, we can derive our cash flow. Now, investing activities, as the words sounds like, are um, cash inflows from like the sale of long-term assets, or sometimes you'll hear those fixed assets, the sale of investments you get cash inflows from, Okay, or something like the collection on loans. So a lot of times what you look at here is your long-term assets, your building, your land, your equipment, those type of accounts. You also look at your investment accounts, whether they're long-term or short-term. So we invest money, they go in here. So if you buy stock in another company, that's an investment. If you have a notes receivable, for example, that's not directly related to sales revenue, then we have it going under our investing activity. So those types of things are investing inflows. Now what would be an investing outflow? Well the same concept, it's the exact same items only it's the purchase of. So the purchase of long-term assets. The purchase of investments because you buy them. Okay. The lending of money, so loans to others. When we lend money on a note receivable for example that would be our investing activity. So a good way to remember investing activities is look at long-term assets. Now we do have a couple of short terms like short-term investments that fall in here, but we see that word investment we know, but look towards your long-term assets and explain the changes in your long-term assets and you can typically come up with your investing cash flows. And last we've got our financing activities. Now financing activities we move below the line into liabilities. So usually financing activities our um, one, our cash inflows, one would come from owners, so that would be the issuance of stock. When we issue common stock to owners, our owners contribute money. It would also be owners' in, uh, contributions in a proprietorship, for example. If we issue bonds, there again, we got those long-term debt pieces, issue bonds, or if we issue notes, okay? So here, when you look at your liabilities, you've got your long-term liabilities, your bonds payable, your notes payable, things of that nature. And under your equity, you've got your issuance of stock. Okay. Now, what are cash outflows when we're talking about financing activities? Well, cash outflows 
are going to be things like the payment of dividends. So when we go to pay dividends on those issued shares, okay, another one may be repurchasing. We just talked about in prior unit here, treasury stock. So repurchasing stock, the cash chain exchange in there. And then also when we pay off debt, repayment of debt. Those are financing activities. Now we do have to be careful. Even though a note receivable goes under investing and a financing, a, a note payable goes under financing activity, interest, interest goes under operating. Okay, so we have to be careful with that. That's sort of one of those sticking points because a lot of people say, oh, interest on a note, since the note's an investing or a financing activity, then that sort of creates a little bit of an issue. So the interest is going to be part of operating because we assume we use that interest to generate our revenues. Okay. So that's sort of a little catch there. Now, when we create the financial or the financial statement, the statement of cash flows, there's two methods we can use. One is the direct method, and this directly links the income statement to the um, cash flows from operating or the indirect method. Now, keep in mind, operating activities are the only activities that we can do either the direct or the indirect method for. All others are always the direct. So when you say you do the indirect method, you're only referring to indirect method for operating activities. The direct method is used for investing and financing. So we really use direct across the board, except operating can be direct or indirect. Typically speaking, though, if you do operating indirect, you do have to reconcile it back to the income statement using the indirect. So you really are double dipping there a little bit. But Operating activities, when we say we use the indirect method or the direct method, that's what we're talking about. All the others are always just a one-for-one -one direct method. All right. So let's look at an example and let's go through and see what we can come up with for this company. So we're working on chapter 21 in ours. So this is lecture one for statement of cash flows. I should change that name. So this is statement of cash flows, lecture one. Here's the comparative balance sheets for 21 and 20 and the statement of income for 2021 are given below for Parker Company. Additional information from Parker's. Let me pause that and fix it. I had a little typo. That's what I get for copying sections of problem. But anyway, additional information from uh, Parker's accounting records is provided also. So we've got Parker's comparative balance sheets for 21 and 20. And you can see all of the information. Now over to the side, I went ahead and added a column for you called change. Because we really need to know the change in each of our items. The cool thing about statement of cash flow, if you can explain every change on your balance sheet, you've completed the statement of cash flow. So it's really sort of a neat little thing. And then we've got our income statement because this is going to be our operating cash flows. Remember, operating cash flows comes from revenues and expenses. And then we've got some additional information that we'll take into account. I always like to look at my differences and then go from there to find um, my actual cash movement in each of my accounts. Okay. All right, so required. Prepare a statement of cash flows for Parker Company for the year ended December 31st, 2021. Present cash flows from operating, present, excuse me, cash flows from operating activities by the direct method. So that's where we're going to start. Again, cash flows from operating under the direct method. Investing and financing is always the direct method. All right, so the direct method we're going to use here for operating, again, investing and financing is always direct. So if you ever say indirect, you're simply referring to the operating activity section of the cash flow statement. All right, so how do we do this? Well, first and foremost, when we do the direct method, really there's two things we have to consider. Cash inflows from customers, our revenues, and cash outflows. Now, cash outflows can go to multiple people. So let's just sort of start there and see what can we do. And let me see if I can maybe add a, do we have a secondary column here? I do not. So maybe, oh, we can talk about the side. Maybe, nope, we can't. All right, let me uh, fix my formatting here really quickly. All right, so I fixed my formatting. So let's talk about this. One, our sales revenue here. What would our sales revenue be in regards to our statement of cash flow? Well, this would be cash inflows from our customers because our customers is what allows us to generate our revenue. Then when we get to our expenses, where, where would those go? Well, our cost goods sold would be our cash outflow. And who would that go to? Well, it would go to our suppliers, right? They're supplying our inventory. And then our salaries, what would that be? Well, it would be a cash outflow, but to whom? 
well to employees, right? So we got these cash outflows going to our employees. Now depreciation expense, what would that be? Well, depreciation expense is a non-cash, so this is not reported because when you have a non-cash event, remember when you record depreciation, you debit depreciation expense and you credit the accumulated depreciation. So really, depreciation expense is not reported on the statement of cash flow. Now, if we do the indirect method, we do have to reconcile for it, but in the direct method, it's not reported. Next is interest expense. I know I'm a little bit off here. Can I sort of squelch that down a little bit to get it in? There we go. I'm trying to line it up a little better. There we go. Interest expense. Well, who is that to? Well, that is cash outflow to, you can either say to creditors, or you can say for interest either way. Okay. So we know. Now keep in mind, interest expense, even though the note, that would be on a notes payable, even though the money in and out from the note payable itself is part of financing where we borrow those funds, the interest paid on those notes will always be part of operating. Loss on sale of land. Well, what type of asset is land? Land is a long-term asset. And when we have cash inflow and outflow from long-term assets, where does that go? Well, that's going to be part of investing. So I'm going to put not reported, but that's because it is part of investing activities. It is not part of operating. All right. And then the last thing is income tax expense. Well, is that related to operations? Absolutely. We pay income tax expense based on... Um, our income. So therefore, this is going to be a cash outflow to whom? Well, to the government. Or we can put in there for taxes. Either way, I'm okay with. So when we look at this, we look at our income statement, we pretty much have all of our classifications of cash inflows and outflows. But we can't just take that number and go with it because remember, Revenues, this 380, while we hope that it's all cash, may not yet be cash. Why is that? Well, remember, when we go in and we sell goods, we either receive cash and credit sales revenue, or we debit accounts receivable. Also, if our accounts receivable went down, that means we've got cash coming in that may not yet be reported. So what we need to do then is, in addition to looking at our income statement, we have to go and find those operating assets and liabilities. In other words, Operating assets and liabilities are those assets and liabilities that are created because of income activities, such as you purchase inventory on account, or you sell goods on account, or you collect cash on account. Remember, all of those are related directly to the income statement, but they cause our income statement to not be 100% cash basis, okay? So what would we do there? Well, what I like to do is go through each of our different items and look at what would be our operating versus long term. So let's go up to our assets to start with. One, our cash account. Now when we look at our cash account, we do have to be careful here. This is what we're trying to prove out. So we're not gonna show it right now. That's the number we need to get to once we're done with our statement of cash flows. We need to see a change of 12. If we don't, we've got an issue. So that's what we're trying to prove out. So let's talk about accounts receivable. Is accounts receivable an operating asset? Absolutely, because remember, what creates accounts receivable? It's the sales of goods or services on account. So therefore, as it changes, so will our revenues. Now, did our accounts receivable go up or did it go down? Well, it went down by two. So if it went down by two, then how much would our revenue or our cash go up? our cash would go up by two because think about it how do you decrease the receivable you credit the receivable and what do you debit cash so cash goes up so what that tells me is there are two dollars let's just keep it simple I know it says in thousands but let's just say two dollars there's two dollars here that we collected in cash that is not represented in this 380,000 so what does that mean well our cash inflows from customers we didn't get 380 we got 382 there. All right. Now, any more short-term operating assets? Well, no. Short-term investment, guess what that is? Investment would be investing. Our inventory. Oh, yes, there he is. Looky there. That's a short-term operating asset. So what's happening to our inventory? Well, our inventory is going from 70 up to 75. So it's increasing by five. Okay. Now, would that be a cash inflow or outflow? 
Well, that's going to be considered part of the outflows, so we'll deal with that in just a few moments because we purchase inventory. That's not part of the revenues, that's part of the expenses. And then land, buildings, and accumulated depreciation, all of that is long term, so we can ignore those at the moment. So anything else related to revenues? Absolutely not, just the accounts receivable. So let's go down here and let's look at our statement of cash flows and what we need to do. So we're going to split our screen. First and foremost, I'm going to go down here and say, okay, I've got cash inflows. Now again, this is cash flows from operating. So our total cash flows from operating activities. First, we're going to do inflows. So what do we got for our inflows here? Well, go back to our income statement. The only cash inflow we had was from our customers. So I'm going to say from my customers. Now, how much cash inflow are we going to have from our customers? Well, one, we're going to start with 380. So don't type this in yet. Just, just pay attention. It's 380. Then we need to go and look and see, did anything else impact that from a balance sheet standpoint? We go up and look at our assets. Yes, accounts receivable would be directly related to revenues. Since AR went down, cash would go up. So therefore, I need to show two. That means I received 2000 more in cash this period that was not part of our actual sales revenue. So our cash inflows from customers would be 382. All right, anything else? Well, no, that was the only info that we had on our income statement. Now we would, if we had interest or any of that, we'd have to take all that into account because that would be inflows, but that's their only inflow on our income statement. So therefore, we can move to our outflows. So what's our cash outflows? Well, let's look at those. We have several here, so let's just go through them and write them down and then figure out how much it is. So one is to suppliers of goods. That's one. The next one is to our employees. That's our salaries that we have to pay out. Next, we've got, now you can do two creditors. That's perfectly fine because you're paying interest, or you can put in there for interest, either way. What else do we have? Let's shrink this down just a little bit. And then we've got, we decided to the government, or for taxes, maybe a better way to report that. All right, so we've got several options here. And again, all of this comes from our income statement. We can look at our income statement and get an idea of where we spent our funds, okay? All right, now let's go up and find any more. So let's start with our suppliers. Cost of goods sold is part of our supplier, so I'm gonna go and I'm gonna put 130 there. Now, what else would impact our supplies? Well, remember, when you buy goods, what may you do? Well, you may put them on account, or you may change your inventory. So when you're looking at cost of goods sold, think of things that are impacted by this flow. One, our inventory, because when you debit cost of goods sold and you credit inventory, you're reducing your inventory. But it doesn't take into account the fact that we also had to buy and we may have bought some supplies that we have not yet sold. Okay, so let's go up here and look at operating impact. That would be supply uh, of goods. All right, so we've got our inventory account. It changed by five. Okay, so that's one. What else would be impacted by this? Well, we've got to take into account our accounts payable because that would be related to supplies. As you buy supplies, you may buy them on account. So if you purchase inventory, we didn't have any supplies expense notice, so we're not, that's part of operating. Um, so when we got accounts payable, if you bought inventory on account, that would be impacted. So when we look at suppliers here, we have to look at our accounts payable. So what happened to our accounts payable? Did it go up or did it go down? Well, our accounts payable went down by seven okay so let's talk about how each of these impact us so our inventory went up by five so that means we paid our suppliers for five thousand more in inventory that we have not yet sold so it's not part of cost of goods sold so we need to take this 130 so let me just put it over here so 130 we need to add the five so as as inventory goes up we spend more cash Okay, so that would be additional cash outflows. As inventory goes down, it may be the reverse. Um, and then accounts payable. What happened to accounts payable? Well, it went down by seven. Okay. So we had 35, now we've got 28. So it went down by seven. So what's going on there? Well, how do you take accounts payable down? Well, accounts payable is debited. 
cash is credited. What happens when we ca credit cash? Well, that's additional outflows. So we need to take the 130 plus the 5 plus the 7. So we need to look for those types of assets and liabilities that would impact or indicate that we paid um, our suppliers in cash. So now, 130 plus 5 plus 7 gives us an outflow of 142. So I'm going to put it in brackets just so we see that that's an outflow. All right. So, so far so good. Now let's look to our employees. How much should we pay our employees? Well, we're going to start with our income statement. Salaries, expense, cash flow was 45. So that's going to be my starting point. Now I need to reconcile that back for any cash items that wouldn't have been reflected in my income statement. So what would be there? Well, think about salaries. When we pay out salaries, expense, what's the offset that may exist? Well, it may be our salaries payable. So let's check. Did our salaries payable change? Absolutely, it did. It went, let's see, from 5 to 2, so it went down by 3. Okay, so down by 3. So what does that mean? Well, for a payable to go down, we have to debit the payable. We credit the cash. So that means we spent 3 more in cash than what's represented in our salaries expense there. All right, anything else? Well, that's the only thing that indicates we made any payments to our employees. So that's going to give us a cash outflow of 48 for our employees. Sorry, I had to pause the video there for just a few moments. Um, so where were we? So we were looking at interest next. So we've got our employees. So now let's look at our payments to creditors and where that comes from. Well, let's start with our income statement. We've got our interest expense. So that would be part of our payments to our creditors. So we're starting out at 12. So let's just go here and we'll say, hey, 12. Do I need to increase it or decrease it? Well, it depends. When we hit interest expense, what other possibilities do we have? Well, we debit interest expense to increase it. What would we credit? Well, we either credit cash because we pay for the interest or we credit interest payable. So let's go see. Do we have a change in our interest payable? So interest payable, we had a change from 3 to 5. So that means our interest payable actually went up by 2. So that means we recorded interest expense that was not paid in cash. So as our liability goes up, we would then subtract that from our payment there. Because that means our liabilities increased, so we didn't pay as much in cash as we have on our income statement. All right? Anything else to deal with interest? No, that's it. So notice what we've taken into account so far. All of our short-term assets, except for investments, because that's an investing activity, we've accounted for the changes there. And then for our liabilities, all of our operating liabilities so far, except for income tax payable. Notice notes payable and bonds payable, those would be long-term activities. So those would not be operating activities. Those would be financing activities, okay? All right, so one last thing. Oh, let's put our total in for our interest since we've accounted for all of those. That would be 10 for our interest. Now let's talk about income taxes to the government or for taxes, however you labeled that. So let's go to our income statement. Again, we're explaining everything on our income statement in the operating activities section. So our income statement here, we've got income tax expense of 70. Now, Again, when we hit income tax expense, typically we credit income tax payable, and then eventually we pay it out in cash. So let's see what happened to our income tax payable. Go back up to the top. Income tax payable went from 12 to 9. So our income tax payable, it appears, actually went down by 3. So that means in addition to the income tax expense that we recorded, we have also paid an additional three in cash to cover our income taxes for the period. Um, so we're going to go in. Notice, since our liability went down, that means we had a cash outflow. So that would be 73 would be our total there. All right, so let's just double check. Did we take into account everything on the income statement? Yes, we have. Everything that is on our income statement, we've accounted for in our operating section. Unless we didn't need to. Remember, depreciation is a non-cash, so it will never be reported as far as um, operating activities go. And loss on sale of land, while it's important, that would be an investing activity, not an operating activity. So we would not take it into account. So we've accounted for everything on our income statement. Have we accounted for all our assets and liabilities that are operating assets and liabilities? Well, we've talked about accounts receivable. Now, cash, we're showing overall, so we don't want to deal with that one just yet. 
We've got our accounts receivable check. We've got our inventory check. Investments, that would be investing, and then long-term assets would be investing. So we don't have to worry about those yet. Did we get our short-term operating liabilities? Absolutely. All of those have taken into account. Our notes and our bonds, remember those are long-term, so there's going to be financing activities. So we've taken into account all of what we would call our operating assets and liability changes. So that's very good. So we should be able to get our net cash flow from operations. So we take 382, we subtract out our outflows, and we end up with 109. All right. So notice that's the direct method. We take everything that's on our income statement, then we reconcile back to make sure we get our true cash flow for our direct method. Now let's talk about our investing activities. Now investing activities take into account a few things. One, the purchase or sale of long-term assets and the purchase and sale of investments. Okay, so those are our two items we really need to look for when we're talking about our actual cash flows from investing. So let's go up here and start. We've got one, well, let's just highlight the two items that would be investing here. Definitely need to take into account our short-term investment. Let's do blue. I like it better. There we go. Ooh, I don't like that at all, so let's just get rid of that. Ooh, y'all know. So short-term investment, and then we need to take into account our long-term assets. So our short-term investment changed here. How much did our short-term investment change by? Well, it went from 15 to 40. Hmm. So our short-term investments actually went up by 25. So that would be a debit to short-term investment and be a credit to cash. But now we have to be careful when we talk about these assets. We can't just automatically assume, hey, we just bought 25. What could have happened is we bought 50 and sold 25. So we would have a cash inflow and outflow. So when we have these items like investments, we have to be careful that we understand the full change. So let's go and do some research. What happened here? Well, one, land that originally cost 10 was sold for 7. Well, land we'll take into account now. We're looking at short-term investments. B, the common stock of Microsoft Corporation was purchased for 25000 as a short-term investment, not classified as a cash equivalent. Remember, cash equivalents are very, very short-term investments that will be converted by force to cash. So if you invest in a bond that matures in two weeks from the balance sheet date, that's a cash equivalent because it will convert to cash within the next very short period of time. Um, so this is a short-term investment. In other words, we only plan to hold it for no more than the next year, but it's not considered a cash equivalent. So that's one. We purchased for 25000 Cash would go down, so that would be an outflow. Anything else with the investments? Absolutely not. So that 25000 is a cash outflow. So that's going to be the purchase of short-term investments. So again, go through and um, prove out all the changes on the balance sheet. And any of them that are cash related, you should include in our operating or in our investing activities when we're talking about assets. Okay. All right. So let's go up here for land. What happened to land? Well, Notice land went, whoops, land went down by 10. Now, we have to be really careful of that. If land went down by 10, what was the actual cash received? So this is where we have to take into account, did we have a gain or a loss? Because think of it this way. When you go to journalize this, and let's just pull up our scrap sheet of paper here. Land has no depreciation, right? So if we go down here, when we sell land, we're going to debit cash for some amount. And we're going to credit our land account for, in this case, 10000 Assuming that's all we did was sell land, we didn't buy any. Now, where's that 10000 split? Well, it's split between the cash or any loss or any gain, okay? Um, gain would be a credit there. So we have to see how much cash did we receive, and how can we tell this? Well, one, did we sell land or a combination of sell and purchase land? So let's go back and look. Our land did change by 10. It went down by 10. So let me put a negative there, by the way. That's a down by 10. So what happened? Well, the land that originally cost 10 was sold. Now, let's assume it doesn't tell us sold for 7. How would we come up with how much they actually sold that land for if it doesn't give us the actual amount of cash sale? Could you do it? Well, absolutely. Remember, when I said this journal entry, our land goes down by 10. Our cash goes up by some amount. We take into account any gain or loss. So did we take a gain or loss? Where would we find that? Well, that would be on our income statement. Lo and behold, it says we have a loss on land for three. 
So would a loss be a debit or credit? Well, a loss would actually be a debit. So we would go and debit for 3,000 our loss. So what's the only thing left? Well, that means we must have received cash of seven. So if they have, even if they had not told us that, that cash price of seven, we could find it because it tells us uh, through this. Now it did say, let me undo, it did say for seven, so we know it was seven. Now, would that be a cash inflow or outflow? Now be careful here. A lot of people want to put 10. We're not putting 10. That was the change in cash, or in land, excuse me, but not all of that change was cash related. We only put the cash pieces when you're talking about the operating activity. This is solely cash movement. So this is going to be a cash inflow. So it's going to be the sale of land. So that's going to be an inflow of 7000 or $7 since we're <clears throat> leaving off the zeros. All right. So that one we've taken into account. Now the next thing we need to look at is our buildings and equipment. Did anything happen there? Now keep in mind we have to take into account um, the change in building equipment, but if we sold it may also be part of accumulated depreciation. So let's really look at those two accounts. So what happened to our building account? Well, our building account here, it looks like went up by 150000 So that's sort of an indication we purchased some buildings or equipment, but remember we may have purchased some for two and sold some for 50, equaling that 150. So we have to be careful there. And then notice what happened to our accumulated depreciation. Well, our accumulated depreciation would have changed by 40. Now, accumulated depreciation went up by 40, but remember when accumulated depreciation goes up by 40, that's a credit. Okay. But again, we need to do a little bit further examination of building equipment to see what caused this net change here between the two. All right, so let's go look. One, accumulated depreciation changed by exactly 40. How much did we have on our balance sheet, or excuse me, our income statement? 40. So we debited accumulated, we, or debited depreciation expense and credited accumulated depreciation for 40. So that takes into the account the full change there. So that sort of gives me a good indication that we probably did not sell any assets. But let's research a little further what happened here. So it tells us in Part C that new equipment was purchased for $150,000 in cash. Now, we can have a situation where our equipment goes up by $150 and our note payable goes up by $150. If that's the case, that means we financed it, so it would not be part of our cash flow here. But in this case, we actually pay cash. So what did we do? Well, we purchase uh, our equipment here. So purchase of equipment. And is that a cash inflow or a cash outflow? Well, that's going to be a cash outflow of 150 So we spent a lot of money here on investments. Now, let's think about this for just a minute. Investing activities are our investments and long-term assets. Have we taken into account all the changes that we need to account for? Absolutely. Now keep in mind, if a change is not cash related, you ignore it. I.e. depreciation. Did this have anything to do with cash? Absolutely not. Okay. So therefore we ignore it for the operating, uh, the investing activity section. Now, what happens if, again, our building went up by 150, but then our note payable went up by 150 for financing that building? Well, if that's the case, you do not want to include a non-cash item in investment. So even though we invested in a building, for example, if we did not pay cash for it, it cannot help us explain our, our cash change. So therefore, you would leave that out. Okay, so be really careful with that. All right. So since we've accounted for all our assets, I believe we're done with our investment. So let's go through and add these up. 150, 25, that gives us a cash outflow of 175 minus 70. So we have a net cash outflow from investing activities of 168. Okay. All right. Now the last thing we need to look at. Now notice we've taken into account a lot of changes on our balance sheet and our income statement. We do have some left. We need to take into account the changes in our long-term notes and then changes in our balance sheet stockholders equity section. Okay, again, when you look at statement of cash flows, you want to understand the entire thing, uh, change to our balance sheet, and that can help us explain our cash flow. So let's go with financing activities. Again, that's long-term notes and stockholders equity we need to analyze. So let's start with our notes payable. What happened to notes payable? Well, notes payable went down by 30. Okay, so that indicates that we may have paid off a note. So let's go and do some research. And again, in textbook learning, the research is going down here and reading the other. 
A $30,000 note was paid at maturity on January 1st. All right, so that's a cash outflow. So here we go. So repayment of notes payable here. <clears throat> and that's a loss of $30 in cash, $30,000, because we paid off that note. All right, <clears throat> so let's go up to the next one. We fully accounted for that note payable. It was all cash basis. Bonds payable. Bond payable went up by 60. Okay. And again, to take a bond up by 60, you would credit the bond and you would debit cash. Now we have to be careful here. Remember when we issue a bond, that's the hard thing about statement of cash flows. You have to remember everything. We would debit cash for the issue price. Then we would hit any discount that we had or premium if it existed. And then we would hit bonds payable at the face amount. Okay. So if we issued these bonds at a premier discount, we would not have any cash, or the cash movement wouldn't equal the change, so you'd have to take that into account. Did we have any premium or discount on bond? No, none's listed, so that indicates to me we probably issued these at face, and we did not issue them to buy equipment, it appears. So let's go look and see what happened there. Let's see, on January 1st of 2021, bonds were sold at their face, $60,000 face value. So what does that tell us? Well, that means the cash we received equaled the 60 and the face value equals the 60. So we're going to debit cash and credit bonds. There was no premium or discount since it was issued at face. So what happens to my cash then when we issue those bonds? You can put issuance of bonds or you can do sell of bonds. Okay, either way. That means our cash went up by 60. Okay, and personally, instead of sell of bonds, I like to say issuance of bonds payable, just because I prefer the terminology. All right, for 60, cash coming in. All right, so, so far, we've explained almost everything, so let's continue on. The last thing we need to look at is any changes in our common stock, because if money comes into the company, that means the uh, owners may have invested, so cash would come in. So let's see, my common stock went up by... 50 it looks like but that doesn't explain all the change there because remember let's go back and do the entry when we issue stock what do we do well if we issue it for stats for tax for stack for cash we debit cash we credit the common stock and then what else do we credit well if we receive more cash than the par of the stock we hit paid in capital and excess of par so really, when we look at stock, we need to look at two things. We need to look at the common stock, and we also need to look at any change in paid-in capital. Paid-in capital went from 100 to 126, so that's going to be a change of 26 there. Now, what did we issue the common stock for? Did we issue it for land or for cash or something like that? So let's go down. It says common stock, $50,000 par, was sold for $76,000 in cash. Okay. So that tells us that they did sell it for above par, so they would have sold it for 76, which we already had analyzed and knew because of our journal entry, so we know that. So that's going to be an issuance of common stock, or you can put sell of common stock, I just like the word issuance better, for 76. All right. Doing good so far. The only thing we haven't fully explained is the change in retained earnings. Notice we've taken into account everything on our income statement. We've taken into account everything on our balance sheet except retained earnings. So now let's look at the change in retained earnings. Retained earnings here would change by, it looks like, 45. And it actually overall increased by 45. So let's stop and think about that for just a few moments. What impacts retained earnings? Well, there's two things. One, you take beginning retained earnings, which was 90, you add income, you subtract any dividends, and then that gives you your ending retained earning balance. So in here, do they tell us what cash dividends? Well, it says net income of 80, which we already knew right there, 80, and cash dividends of 35 were paid to shareholders. Well, that's sort of cheating. They're telling us exactly what we need. Could we figure it out? What happens if they didn't tell us any of this? What if that, that sentence, let's just highlight that, what if that sentence didn't even exist? Could we go and figure this out? Absolutely. Assuming the dividends were cash. Now, we would have to make an assumption the dividends were cash. If they did any stock dividends, that would create a little bit of an issue. So here, 
we know our retained earnings changed by 45. It went from 90 to 135. So how do we calculate retained earnings? So let's do a little quick check here. We take our beginning retained earnings, which we knew to be 90. We add or subtract, if you need to, we add a net income, we subtract a net loss. We knew from the income statement that net income was 80. Then you subtract out any dividends. All right. And then that's going to give us what we call our ending RE. Well, we know our ending RE has to be, how much? Go back. Needs to be 135. I about typed 145. I'm glad I checked. 135. So, how do we get it? Well, let's just do a little subtotal here. 90 plus 80 gives us what? 170, right? So, we have 170 in total. We need to get down to 135. What does that tell us? Well, 135, 45, 55, 65. So that means 35,000 has to be in dividends. Now we do need to know is this cash dividends because we could hit stock dividends or property dividends or something weird. Um, so is this actually cash dividends to find that change? Yes, it is. We know from the sentence over here that it is, but keep in mind, if it did not give us this information, I mean, they already gave us net income, but it, let's assume they did not give us this. Let, let's assume it said that, and cash dividends were paid to shareholders. How would you go about finding that cash dividend? Well, remember retained earnings, because we basically have to explain every change on our balance sheet in the statement of cash flows. So our retained earnings changed by 45. So if we go and look, we know that that 45 change was made up of 80 in income, but then that would tell us how much our dividends was in order to get us down to that 135. So that means 35. Now dividend payments are going to be part of financing activities. Okay, so now that we know that's 30, so let's go over here. So the payment of dividends, the cash dividends since that's the type they are. And that's going to be an outflow of 35. Okay, now, once you fully take in a, into account all the changes and understand are they cash, are they not cash and everything, you're ready to finish up. So let's go over here. What's our financing activity? So 30, 60, 76, and 35 gives us net of 71. So let's get rid of the split. So let's go through. We know operating activities was 109. We know our investing was 168, and our financing hopefully is 71. So add those up. 190, 109, excuse me, 109 minus 168 plus 71. That gives us a net increase in this case of 12. Now keep in mind that was the one little number on our balance sheet that we had not yet explained. So that's the whole goal. When you're done, that net change on your statement of cash flow better equal the actual change in your cash. If it doesn't, then you're wrong somewhere. You need to fix it. So that 12 needs to equal 12. Then we do the last little thing, and that's reconcile out. 90, 90 plus 12 there should give us exactly what? Why not put 90? should be 30, sorry. 30 plus 12 would give us 42. I'm back to my retained earnings there, sorry. We have 30 in our January 1st balance. Plus the 12 ends with 42. I was like, 102, that doesn't sound right. So yes, make sure you pull this from your balance sheet, okay? So 30 plus 12 should give you the 42. Now there is one little note that we would have to do. We don't have any in this problem, but below the line you need your non-cash events. So for example, what if our note payable had gone up by 150 and our building up by 150? Well, that means you purchased that building on account. So we would not have had, excuse me, equipment on account. We wouldn't have this line. Below the line down here, we would say summary of uh, significant non-cash events. And we would put in there that we purchased the building by signing a note 150. So that when people go to reconcile out, they can look and see, ooh, your building change or equipment changed by 150, but you don't have anything on your cash. So that sort of summarizes for them so that they can see what created those changes. Statement of cash flow is very comprehensive. So make sure as you're going through the statement of cash flow, you're paying attention to the changes in your balance sheet and explain every single change. Okay, changes in retained earnings go here. So change in retained earnings besides dividends. 
That would be your income. So this is going to be your revenues, your expenses, and then your short-term operating assets and liabilities. Your investing activities, those are going to be your long-term assets and your short-term investments or any investments, whether short-term or long-term. And then our financing activities are going to be basically your long-term notes, so your notes payable, your bonds, and then your changes in stockholders' equity besides the net income piece that we already dealt with in operating activities. So when you're looking at it, that's really how you break the balance sheet up so that you can tell the difference between operating, investing, and financing. All right, it's a long video, I know, 45 minutes, but statement of cash flows are notoriously long. So I hope you have a great day.